Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Piersonet Excel International A Level, Chemistry Unit 3 for June 2022. Let's begin with question 1. Question 1 says an experiment is carried out to determine the enthalpy change for the reaction between zinc and copper 2 sulfate solution. This is the equation for the reaction. And then they say the procedure weigh 4.5 grams of zinc powder into a weighing bottle and use a measuring cylinder to transfer 50 centimeters cubed of one mole per decimeter cubed aqueous copper 2 sulfate into a polystyrene cup held in a 250 centimeters cubed beaker. Then they want you to stir the solution with a thermometer and recall the temperature to the nearest 0.5 degrees Celsius and start a timer. Then they want you to continue to stir the solution, recording the temperature every minute. Now, at exactly 3.5 minutes, add the zinc powder to the aqueous copper 2 sulfate solution and then you stir. Then recall the temperature of the solution every minute from 4 to 9 minutes, as we can see the results are displayed here from that experiment. So I'm going to show you what we have here. We have a solution of copper sulfate in here and we are adding zinc. Zinc is added at exactly 3.5 minutes, and that means that is when the reaction starts. So let's continue to the next page. Here they say plot a graph of temperature against time on the grid, and that is what I did. I put all the points using the results from the table. Now the question down here says use the graph to determine the maximum temperature change, delta T, in this experiment, and you must show you're working on the graph. To do that, I drew two lines of best fit. The first line of best fit through the first set of data and the second line of best fit through the second set of data. This vertical line must be drawn at 3.5 minutes because that is when the experiment started. So connecting the two, the maximum reach temperature should be about that, which is 66 degrees Celsius. And the lowest is going to be the average we have here, which is 22. So to find the delta T, I got 66 minus 22, and that gave me 44. Other points that are acceptable are around here. If you drew the line of best fit through that set or that set, you still get a delta T that can be acceptable. Here they say state why using a series of measurements gives a more accurate temperature change than taking the initial and highest temperature. If you take the initial and the highest temperature, let me take you back. When we take the initial, remember the initial was less than 22. And this could be the highest obtained temperature based on the experimental results. That will give us a delta T which is lower because it does not account for cooling. So I said the reaction occurs at changing rates, meaning it's not instantaneous. So using a line of best fit ensures that cooling that occurs during the reaction is considered. That is why I drew the two line of best fit so that I can be able to attain or to get the maximum attainable temperature, which is, let me take you back here, which is that point here. If I did not draw this line of best fit connected to this one here, I wouldn't have got that point here. By that, my maximum temperature would have been this one, which would have given me a lower delta T. Part B says, show the calculation that zinc powder is in excess. To do this, we have to look at the two reactants and calculate the moles of each. So the moles of zinc and mass divided by molar mass, which is 4.5 divided by 65.4, and it gave me that. This can be atomic mass because it's a zinc, it's an atom. And then here, moles of copper sulfate, we have the concentration and the volume. So I multiply that and I get 0.05. When we compare this and that, we can see this is higher than that. And therefore, this one is limiting and that was in excess. So here I said zinc is going to be in excess. The next part says calculate the energy transfer in the reaction in joules. Assume the specific capacity of the solution is this one here. Now we know this equation Q is mc delta T. The mass is going to be the volume of the copper sulfate solution that was used. And then the C is given as that. The delta T is from the graph, which is 44. Calculating everything, you get 9240. But remember, when you calculate, the value comes out as joules. The next part says state a second assumption other than the specific capacity of the solution that you have made in your calculation. Now, in this calculation, we have assumed that the mass of copper sulfate is 50, meaning the volume is equal to the mass. Yet, that is not the exact correct thing. So, we have made that as an assumption. We have assumed that the density of that solution is 1 gram per centimeter cube, which is similar to the density of pure water. Also, we have ignored the specific capacity of zinc as well as copper, 
or we have assumed it to be zero. So those are the two possible assumptions. Moving on. Next, they say calculate the enthalpy change of the reaction using your answer to B1 and B2. We know this is an exothermic reaction because temperature increased, so delta H can equal to negative Q over N. So in this case, it's going to be delta H. Remember, we have to convert the Q has to be in kilojoules, so I divided the Q we had, which was 9240 by 1000, to create negative 9.240, and then divide it by the number of moles. These number of moles should be moles of the one that was finished. Remember, we had two reactants. One of them was in excess. The one that was not in excess, its moles are the ones that are used here. So when we divide, we get negative 184.8 kilojoules per mole. Down here, they say identify two improvements in the experimental procedure that would improve the accuracy of the results other than repeating the experiment and justify your answers. I said you need to put a lead on the polystyrene cup to reduce the heat loss. And then you need to use a pipette to measure the volume of copper sulfate to minimize the uncertainty. Remember, a pipette is going to be more accurate. Then I said you measure the temperature more often to get more accurate results. If you measure the temperature more often, it means you're going to have more points and the line of best fit is going to be more accurately drawn. So I also said use a more accurate thermometer. Remember the thermometer they used was measuring up to 0.5. So if you can use a thermometer that has more gradations, it is going to give you a more precise temperature and therefore you can get a more precise temperature change. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two, the hydrogen carbonate of an unknown group on metal is a white solid. The students carried out a titration experiment using hydrochloric acid. The results were used to determine a value for the relative formula mass of the metal hydrogen carbonate and thus obtain a value for the relative atomic mass AR of M. They say both students made solutions containing 2 gram of the metal hydrogen carbonate. The first student made a 250 centimeters cubed standard solution, and the second student made a solution by placing the metal hydrogen carbonate in a beaker, dissolving the solid in a liter deionized water, and then filling the beaker to the 250 centimeters cubed mark. They say both students titrated, 25 centimeters cubed of their solution using hydrochloric acid with a concentration of 0.15 mole per decimeter cubed, and they used the STEM method and equipment. The students repeated their titrations until uh, they achieved concordant titers. The first student obtained the main titer, which is 13.35 centimeters cubed. So they want us to calculate the value for the AR of the metal M from the data of the first student. Here they said the metal hydrogen carbonate and HCl have a ratio of 1 to 1. And then you must give your working and give your answer to two decimal places. So here I wrote an equation of the reaction because this is a group 1 metal, so the ratio is going to be 1 to 1 when you balance the equation of the reaction. And I know from the information given that the volume of this, that was 25 centimeters cube, and then the titer, which is the volume of HCl used, was 13.35, and this concentration was 0.15, so I'm going to find the number of moles of this, which is concentration times volume. I divided volume by 1000 to convert it to decimeters cubed, and that came out as my number of moles. Here I said moles of the metal hydrogen carbonate in the 25 were exactly that as that because here is 25 centimeters cubed that were used. However, we need to find the moles of the metal hydrogen carbonate in the 250 centimeters cubed, which should be that times 10. So we get this. And down here I say the molar mass is mass divided by number of moles. We have the mass which was 2 grams and the number of moles which is that in the 250. And I got that as the molar mass. Now since I know the molar mass of the whole thing, I can be able to find the atomic mass, which is going to be that minus the component or the contribution from the hydrogen carbon. Remember each carbon is 12 plus 1 hydrogen and plus 3 oxygens. 3 oxygens are 48, that is 12, so 60 plus 1, 61. So from this, we subtract 61, which is the contribution from the hydrogen carbonate. I got 38.875 gram per mole. However, they want us to find the answer to two decimal places. So when I rounded it off, I got 38.88 gram per mole. Moving on. Here they say both students calculated values of the relative atomic mass of M using their calculations and the total percentage and certainty of their experiment. They deduced that M was potassium. The value for AR calculated by the second student was that. 
they wanted to calculate the experimental error for the second student. Since this is the value for the second student, and we know that of potassium is 39.1, the difference or the error is going to be that minus that, and then divide by 39.1 times 100, and that is going to give us the percentage we are looking for. So the answer is 4.04%. Next here they say the second student calculated the AR value of the metal to be that with a total percentage uncertainty of 4.5. Then they say comment on the value that obtained by the student by calculating the range. You remember they want us to find the range of values of AR. We know that the percentage they've given us is 4.5. So 4.5 divided by 100 times 37.52 gives us this. So this is the value we're going to use to find the range. So here I said the range should be that value the student got plus or minus that. So we know if this is going to be 37.52 uh, plus that, which is uh, higher than 39. And then when you subtract that, it's going to be lower than 37. So it means the true value of potassium is going to be within that range. So here I say the AR of potassium is 39.1 and it lies within this range. So that was my comment. First, students suggested that the burette was the biggest source of the experimental uncertainty. They wanted to explain how the percentage uncertainty of the burette rating could be reduced without changing the apparatus or simply repeating the experiment. So here I say, by decreasing the concentration of HCl or increasing the mass of the metal carbonate. If you increase this, it is going to lead to a larger tidal value. And if you get a larger tidal value, the percentage uncertainty is going to be smaller. The key thing here is larger volumes are going to have a lower error, and therefore that would give us a more accurate answer. So down here they say the second student was told that using a beaker to prepare their standard solution was incorrect. They want you to describe the steps the student should take to make a standard solution as accurately as possible, and assume that the student is supplied with two grams of the metal hydrogen carbonate in a weighing bottle and the usual laboratory glassware. So the student has to dissolve the solid, which is two grams of the metal hydrogen carbonate, into a small volume of distilled water inside a beaker. After they dissolve, the student has to transfer that into a 250 centimeters cubed volumetric flask, and they have to transfer the washings. You have to add this in order to get that point. And then after that, they have to make up to the 250 centimeters cubed mark of the volumetric flask, with distilled water because the water has to be distilled like that. And then continuing on, the student should stop at the flask and check to obtain a solution of uniform concentration. That should be the standard solution. Let's continue. Here they say the solution formed from the reaction between the metal hydrogen carbonate and HCl can be evaporated to give a solid metal chloride. They wanted to state the test the student might use on the white solid to show that the M was potassium and include the expected result. Testing for potassium, we need to carry out a flame test. And if the color of the flame is lilac, that is proof to indicate that the metal was potassium. Next, they say describe a test and the expected result to confirm the presence of the chloride ion in the white solid. Because we are testing for chloride, we need to dissolve the metal chloride in distilled water and then to the solution, add nitric acid followed by silver nitrate solution. And if a white precipitate forms, that is confirmation that there was a chloride in the solution. This brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question three says, cyclohexene was prepared by dehydrating cyclohexanol using concentrated phosphoric acid, which is that. The procedure is in step one, approximately 12 centimeters cubed of cyclohexanol was measured into a small flask. In step two, five centimeters cubed of concentrated phosphoric acid was added slowly to the flask with cooling and swirling. In step three, some anti-bumping granules were added to the mixture. And in step four, the flask was set up for distillation using the apparatus shown and the distillate was collected between 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. So this is the setup for the distillation. And in step five, they say, the distillate was transferred to a separating funnel and washed with an aqueous solution of sodium carbonate. Step six says the crude organic product was separated from the mixture, placed in a clean separating funnel and washed with deionized water. Step seven, 
the organic layer was separated and dried using a suitable drying agent. And in step eight, the dried organic layer was distilled over a narrow range of temperature to give pure cyclohexane. Here they've given us a table of boiling point as well as density of the given substances. Here they ask, give the most suitable piece of apparatus for measuring the cyclohexanol in step one. Remember in step one, they measured 12 centimeters cubed and the most suitable apparatus should be the measuring cylinder. Part B says, explain why adding phosphoric acid slowly with cooling and swearing in step two results in a higher yield of cyclohexane. This reaction is occurring between phosphoric acid and cyclohexanol and it's going to be an exothermic reaction because this exothermic cooling is necessary in order to decrease the temperature because if cooling does not occur the temperature is going to increase and cyclohexane that has a lower boiling point could be lost through evaporation leading to a lower yield of the product which is cyclohexane so here i said this reaction is exothermic hence cooling is necessary addition of large amounts of phosphoric acid would cause an increase in temperature that would lead to the evaporation of cyclohexane. Down here they say in step three, anti-bumping granules are present to promote smooth boiling in the mixture. They want you to give a reason other than damage to equipment why bumping should be avoided. If bumping occurs, it can lead to the transfer of cyclohexanol to the collecting flask, which would contaminate the product. Party says, explain why in step four, the distillate is collected in a temperature range of 80 to 90. So we need to see here, we are trying to collect cyclohexane whose boiling temperature is 83. This has to be collected slightly below and slightly above 83. And we see the possible ranges are between 80 to 90 because way above 90, we have a boiling temperature for water and you do not want to collect water. So the suitable ranges should be that. Here I say, because the range at which the product, cyclohexane, is collected starts below the boiling point of cyclohexane and finishes below the boiling point of water. This should minimize the amount of impurities that can be distilled over. Then in part E they say, state what is removed by washing the mixture with sodium carbonate solution in step 5 and they want you to include an ionic equation. We know that in step 5 they added sodium carbonate which is going to neutralize the phosphoric acid to remove it. And the equation for that reaction should be the H plus ions from the phosphoric acid plus the carbonate, giving us carbon dioxide and water. Moving on. Here they say, after washing in step 5, the separating funnel contains two layers. They want you to draw a diagram of the separating funnel and label its contents. Based on the information we have here, we can see the density of cyclohexane is that and the density of water is that. So we can see water is going to be denser and therefore should be at the bottom layer while the organic product should be at the top layer because it's less dense. The next part they say suggests what may be removed by washing the product with deionized water. When we wash the product with deionized water, we are removing ionic compounds like sodium phosphate. Down here they say identify one substance that could be used as a drying agent in step 7 of this procedure and they want you to justify your choice. I chose this one here, magnesium sulfate, because this is going to be a solid, number one. This is out, that is out, because they are liquids. This one here is going to be out as well. These are hydrated, they can go out. So the suitable choice is magnesium sulfate, because it is anhydrous and it will not react with the organic compound. So that was the choice I chose. Here they say, chemical tests may be used to show whether or not reactants and products are present during the course of the procedure. Then they say, state a chemical test and the expected observation for the carbon-carbon double bond. To test for presence of a carbon-carbon double bond, we need to use bromine water. And if the color changes from orange-brown to colorless, we can confirm that there was a carbon-carbon double bond. The next part they say, state a chemical test and the expected observation for an OH group. To test for an OH group, we need to add PCO5. And if misty fumes are observed, then that is a confirmation. Or we could use sodium, and if effervescence is observed, that could be a confirmation as well. Lastly, here they say state whether or not the test in G2 could be used on the organic product to show if cyclohexanol remains when step 5 is complete, and they want you to justify your answer. This is wrong because PCO5 will react with water. Remember, there will be water, so it will react with water, and when it reacts with water, you are going to get a false positive result. 
Let me show you this reaction here. When PCO5 reacts with water, we get phosphoric acid and HCl, and you might observe misty fumes. Now, also, when you use sodium, sodium is also going to react with water as this reaction, and we see hydrogen is going to be produced, and again, we see effervescence, which could lead to a faulty positive result. So this brings us to the end of question three, as well as to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.